Hi, this is your host Abdul Bhartia and we are here at KubeCon and Cloud Native Con in Paris and we have with us once again Matt Butcher, CEO of Fermion. Matt, it's great to have you back on the yeah, show. Thanks for having me back again. First of all, what I want to talk to you about, you know, uh, the audience that comes to your booth, the discussions that you have, where is this WebAssembly in those discussions, the maturity of the audience, under, you know, so let's talk about uh, the state. Yeah, and I think, and, and this is a perfect question for this KubeCon because uh, WebAssembly has been showing up here now for uh, three, four uh, consecutive KubeCons. And we really started out uh, in that very much experimental phase where people were coming in and the number one question they were asking is, what is this WebAssembly thing I've been hearing about? Uh, and, and is there anything I can do with it? And then as we've unfurled this story over, over years and as the standard has solidified, as momentum has gained, things have changed. And this year, a really amazing thing is that people are saying, oh, this is solving production use cases for me. This density, uh, performance, the cost efficiency that I can get, you know, driving down the cost of my Kubernetes cluster, this is solving a real problem that I have. So at this KubeCon, our booth conversations have drastically changed from the what is WebAssembly conversations to the I see what this does and I see how it solves this problem. Can we have a good conversation, a good back and forth about how I can make this real in my Kubernetes cluster? And what kind of you know customers, users are these? In the European audience here, we're definitely seeing a lot in sort of the manufacturing space. Uh, a lot of edge is always still uh, you know, edge is always on the forefront of people's minds. How do we get workloads closer to users? So we're seeing a lot of edge conversations. Uh, and then, you know, interestingly enough, a lot of places that are running large scale websites are also noticing that they can get huge density uh, improvements and also be able to do this kind of instant scalability that you get with WebAssembly that you just don't get with containers. And that's exciting then too. Uh, that was not a, a target audience you know, that we anticipated talking to, but the energy and the vibe they're bringing to these conversations uh, has us going, oh, wow, okay, this is definitely, uh, you know, along with these manufacturing and edge use cases, a case that is to be reckoned with, right? A case that uh, there's a really strong, well-articulated need and WebAssembly is the perfect solution for it. We are talking a lot about cloud to edge continuum. You know, what is that, you know, from your, because, you know, edge can mean different things for edge people, but there are some defined definition like the source constrained data center closer to user, which has its own limitation, which has its own, you know, advantages also. So if I ask you that, and what is driving this? Yeah, and I think we, probably the simplest way to talk about edge is just the near edge, far edge thing, right? Is it in proximity to me, is it near to me? Is it IOT? Is it uh, you know devices that are sitting in my house or maybe you know in my pocket or on my wrist? You know, or are we talking about uh, far edge? You know, CDNs uh, and and compute uh, computed edge kinds of solutions. And in both of those cases, what we've seen over the last several years is Kubernetes make in, making inroads into those particular kinds of environments. However. Containers are a very heavy workload to run in, as you said, resource-constrained environments. On the, on the CDN style of things, it's not so much that they don't have a lot of compute, it's that they have to very effectively execute really quickly and be able to do that for thousands of customers at a time. Right? And when you're writing your edge software, you want to make it as snappy as possible. In the, in the near edge scenario, in the IoT scenario, once more, you're finding Kubernetes there, but there it's the hardware that's the limitation, right? Running a container really strains some of these systems to their limits, and running a dozen containers is beyond what many of them can do. WebAssembly modules, which are you know, a couple of meg and can instantly start and shut down, uh, those are the kinds of things that do really well in that environment too. So we're really kind of seeing it in both cases, but I think it's following on Kubernetes success that we're seeing WebAssembly now get its big lift this time around. We have also been talking about the waves of you know, cloud. So which wave we are in, and how would you define that wave? Yeah, and I, I like to articulate the, the waves very quickly as, you know, virtual machines represented the first wave of cloud computing, right? A, a book, an online bookstore, Amazon, figured out a way to sell their, their, uh, their, on, their um, uh, hardware by renting it out to people who wanted to run virtual machines. First wave of cloud computing right there. Soon after that, uh, people were saying, that's too big, I want a medium weight kind of class of computing. Containers came around. We saw the incredibly rapid rise of Docker and Kubernetes. And that really, I think, was the second wave of cloud computing, the kind of middleweight class. And then the lightweight class of cloud computing, this third wave that's happening right now, is really how do we just, how do we push down the cost 
push up the density and get this ultra fast performance for a particular segment of applications. The ones we would usually call, you know, Lambda functions or serverless functions. And that's where WebAssembly really shines. So you got virtual machines as the first one, you got containers as the second wave. And now I think we're in this third WebAssembly wave of computing. What is driving this third wave? What either the use cases or the workloads? What we saw with kind of the, the early serverless, right? With Lambda as it took off originally was a lot of sort of like, um, task-based processing, where you would push things through particular workflows. You might have data coming out of one system, you need to do some transformations and then put it into another system. And those are excellent serverless workloads regardless of platform. But what you couldn't do then is really run Lambda functions on your front line because the performance wasn't good enough and the cost ended up being too high. Uh, what we're seeing now with this shift toward WebAssembly as the runtime, and you know, at, at half a millisecond of a cold start time versus Lambda's 200 to 500 milliseconds, suddenly that's a frontline instance, which means we can run API servers, we can run websites, we can you know put this in in cars and in other places on the you know, sort of like the near edge, and that's where we're seeing the momentum pick up here, where people were standoffish to this kind of approach before. They love the programming model, but the runtime considerations were too heavy, vendor lock-in, slow startup, uh, high bills. Now we kind of solve those three problems and SpinCube, an open source project, makes it possible for anybody to get out there and experiment with that right away. I see a lot of excitement on your face, you know, when we talk about new tech, but let's look at the other side as well. With new wave, new technologies, new challenges also emerge, you know, new pain point emerge, you know, the Docker days where there, Kubernetes there. So when you talk to customer, when you look at the whole WASM or WebAssembly, what are, you, you can see that those pain points will emerge after when it goes into production, you, people start using. What are those and how is Fermion kind of preparing itself to tackle those? Your, your summary there is perfect, right? Any new technology, if it's gonna be successful, it's gotta offer some big rewards, right? Tiny incremental changes don't move the needle. But you know, you're always asking somebody to invest in a new technology, learn something new, try something new, potentially put this kind of thing into your staging and then production environment. And with WebAssembly, I mean, the maturity, part of the difference between WebAssembly at KubeCon three years ago and WebAssembly at KubeCon now is that WebAssembly itself as a technology has matured quite a bit. But there are still edges on there that we're, we're going, okay, well, how do we smooth these kinds of things over? Uh, Java has been slow to adopt WebAssembly, and yet Java is one of those enterprise critical languages. Uh, we want to be able to move Java workloads there, but they're kind of lagging behind while Go and Rust and JavaScript and TypeScript and .NET are all moving ahead very rapidly. I think Java really highlights one of the risks here is that if you don't get all of these language ecosystems going and, and kind of moving toward the forefront of the technology, you end up with a choppy implementation. So one of the big things we at Fermion have really tried to focus on is how do we move the standards forward? How do we build some communities? How do we in the cloud native world start forging good connections with the Python language developers and the Java language developers and these groups that we have always sort of just assumed would do all the work we needed and we've never really spent time building relationships there. So honestly, as with almost any human endeavor, the highest risk factor here happens from us not building good human relationships with the other people who are building adjacent technologies. And what role is Fermion playing? You know, as you, you said, you know, building human relationship or uh, as you said, you know, the question is not, you know, question is the question how we can do that. Right. So, so what role are you playing in this ecosystem? Yeah, there are a couple of critical ones, right? The number one, uh, WebAssembly is an open standard. You know, it's implemented on all the major browsers. Uh, it's implemented in a variety of different runtimes. It's, it's, it's standardized by the W3, the standards body that does HTML and CSS. Uh, so you've got a venerable standards community around this. Uh, and then the, the Bytecode Alliance is, is a group that does the that, that does the work on developing the standards and developing the reference implementations. We participate in those standards bodies quite a bit, uh, and we do it because we really care that the top quality reference implementation is is produced and that the specifications are moving along at a decent clip. The, the danger of specifications is always the atrophy effect, right? Where people are busy and specs get slow. So that's one. The other is just being out and building community, which, which a lot of times means reaching out to frameworks and languages and environments and saying, hey, when it comes to deploying these applications, what are, what are your stressors, right? Uh, we worked with the Leptos community. Uh, Leptos is a really cool Rust uh, and JavaScript framework uh, that needs to be deployed somewhere. And they had fairly complicated instructions on deploying to Cloudflare and deploying to Amazon and things like that. And we said, wait, 
this is actually a perfect opportunity to build a bridge here and say, we can make a really easy deployment target for you. You can deploy any of your applications in just an instant. And what we saw immediately was the community coming back and saying, this is fantastic. You know, let's work together more on more of these things. Let's see how we can do some more projects together. And that's exactly how open source communities gain the kind of momentum they need to thrive, right? Not just be there and get software updates and fix the issue queue, but building genuine relationships with these communities around. Uh, and then I think the last one is you come to events like this, right? Where we get to sit down, have a chat face to face, uh, and, and you get this kind of organic movement where ideas cross pollinate, and that really helps build, uh, expand the network out, right? In places, those kind of casual, uh, you know, serendipitous moments where you run into somebody who's now working on a new thing, that forges new alliances into lots of different kinds of uh, uh, projects and different kinds of. Uh, uh, areas of technology, I think I should say there. And that's been really exciting. I think all three of those, Fermion has been very intentional in trying to move them forward. I will go back to the question of the third wave of cloud. Where is Gen AI in that wave? I think that Gen AI really is properly part of this third wave of cloud computing. Uh, the, the, pro the, the problem that we're coping with in this third wave is how to do hyper-efficient cloud compute. And for the last you know, two waves, essentially, when we said cloud compute, all we meant was optimizing CPU processing. Well, now with Gen AI, we're talking about GPUs, and GPUs are much more expensive, much more expensive than CPUs, uh, and, and, and harder to find, too. And that means that any little incremental improvements we can make on, uh, on you know, more efficiency, more density, higher performance, that translates directly to saving money and it translates directly to reducing the strain of scarcity on the market. And so I think this compute thing here, this, this turn we've had in the third wave toward figuring out how to do compute more efficiently really came at just the right moment to sort of embrace the kind of Gen AI movement and say, okay, I know you're coming in with big hefty compute requirements, but we've got some technologies that can help tell that story and make it easier and start to release some of the pressure, the downward economic pressure caused by chip shortages on high prices of GPUs. Uh, a lot of things are in your pipeline uh, that you cannot share publicly, but just give us an idea what to expect from Fermion this year, what things you folks are working on. Yeah, we were really excited, obviously, about the release of SpinCube this week. And, uh, you know, Michelle Donani got up on stage today with with Zeiss, uh, a German lens manufacturer that does amazing stuff, and with Microsoft, uh, and talked a little bit about where we are in our Kubernetes journey. Uh, we released Fermion Platform for Kubernetes, which is an ultra high density platform for large organizations that really need to push many things through. For us, what we're excited about heading into the rest of the year is evolving that WebAssembly standard. There's a technology called the component model uh, that's designed to allow polyglot programming, designed to allow some really interesting ways of deploying distributed applications and I think we're really going to be leaning into that. The WebAssembly world is just moving very quickly and in, in a really exciting direction, enabling some things we haven't been able to do. And I think the, the most exciting thing about being at Fermion is that we're kind of on that, on the, on the, you know, surfing the very edge of that wave going, yes, we've got more to do, we've got more to do. And this is just going to change the way that application developers write code and that platform engineers and DevOps deploy this code into the cloud. Excellent, thank you so much for sharing all those great insights and uh, thank you for your time today. And you know, I look forward to chat with you again soon, thank you. Me too, thank you so much for having me, it's always fun. It's my pleasure.